Well, good evening, and uh, welcome to Pilgrim Theological Seminary. Um, we're a class studying the course called BST 320, the Gospel and Acts, and we won't get to Acts tonight or even the next time we meet, which will be in October, but we will get there eventually. Tonight we're really doing uh, Matthew, and then we'll wrap that up uh, in the sessions tomorrow and then move on to Mark. But uh, I appreciate you coming away from your normal scheduled events at the end of a busy week when you'd like to just kick back and uh, maybe do something recreational. But hopefully this can be even better than just recreational activity as we look at uh, God's Word. And I'm going to pray in just a minute, but I'd like to preface that by uh, talking a little bit about um, this particular session. And our sessions uh, run about 25 minutes, and then we take a five-minute break. That's how we'll be doing this. So if you can just hang on for 25 minutes, then you'll get a minute to nod off or get a drink or uh, have a cigarette or whatever it is that you, you feel like you need to do in those five minutes. But I want to talk a little bit about how to understand the Gospels. And um, on your handout, you can see that I've made a few beginning suggestions. Uh, one is to know what they say. And, uh, you know, you, you're a self-selected group. You're, you're here, uh, not just drug in off the street, but you're here because evidently you're interested in Scripture. And uh, that really is the key to understanding the Gospels, is to, to have read them, and probably have read them repeatedly. Uh, this is to say, if we just go at them sort of from the outside, like we might uh, uh, try to learn about the Amazon rainforest, and not really know that much about it, but just you know, hope to watch a, a show on it to learn something about the rainforest. We'll, we'll learn some things, but I mean, what will we really know about the Amazon rainforest? And um, in the United States, it's said that only 50% of people, this is a recent poll, can even name the Gospels. Now, I thought that was really high. <laughs> but still, uh, most people not only don't read the Gospels or haven't read the Gospels, but can't even name what they are. And uh, one of the points I want to make here from the very beginning is, no matter how good of a class in New Testament survey you took, uh, you still wouldn't know the Gospels from a single class on them, because the only way you get to know the Gospels is by reading the Gospels and uh, really kind of living with them and going over them again and again, as I know some of you will have done over the years. You need to know what they say. I may come back to say something else about that later, but I'll go on to uh, a second observation, and that is uh, we need to read them with uh, some self-interest. Now, not just self-interest, but uh, the Bible is uh, a book of promises, and I don't mean by that uh, a grab bag of benefits for selfish people, but um, we're on an earth in which there are a lot of things that are lamentable, and a lot of things that are troubling, a lot of things that are damaging, and, and we would like to know what we're doing here and how long this is going to last and where it's headed. And the Bible contains God's narration of things and uh, lots of assurances that if we look to him, things will clarify and, and we'll make it with his assistance. And one of the first promises in the Bible, this is right after uh, Adam and Eve fall into sin, uh, God says something to the serpent, and he tell, tells the serpent, serpent, I'm going to put enmity, which is hostility or antagonism, between you, of course that stands for Satan and evil, and the woman. And then in Hebrew form, he kind of says the same thing, but expands it. And between your offspring, the devil and his minions and the forces of evil, and hers, her offspring. 
And you know, this is very good. Uh, when sin came into the world, it's a good thing that God uh, made sure that people would know there's something wrong. <laughs> you know, we hate it that we don't get along with other people any better than we do, but nobody can live very long as a human being on this earth without knowing something's not right. <laughs> You know, there, there's hostility between people. And uh, obviously hostility between evil and people. And God goes on to say, he will crush your head. That is to say, the offspring of the woman will crush your head, serpent. And you, you'll do your damage to the offspring of the woman. Uh, but, you know... Getting struck on the heel is one thing, getting your head smashed is another thing. So early on, and I'm here especially trafficking in the interpretation of the Bible that was popular among the early church fathers. They saw in this what they called, they called it the proto-evangelium. Evangelium meaning gospel and proto meaning first. This is the first proclamation of the gospel in the Bible. And the New Testament, you know, is all about the gospel. And Matthew and Mark, which we're looking at tonight and tomorrow, that's all about the gospel. But the gospel doesn't start with Matthew. The gospel starts all the way back in the Garden of Eden from the very beginning. As soon as there was sin, God had uh, a plan and a purpose to redeem the situation, which is to say to redeem people. And so when we try to understand the gospels, we want to claim God's promise. Not just this promise, but... This is sort of foundational to what is happening in the Bible that leads up to the Gospels and that manifests itself in the Gospels and then that expands and goes forth from the Gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's all about promise and the fulfillment of promises. Now, some of you may be thinking, I have a question, and when can I ask a question? You know, what I would like to do with questions is if you'd write down your question and then uh, at the break... I'll look at the questions, and then I'll decide which ones I can answer. And then I'll try to answer them when we start the next session. Of course, I can do some things off session two, but I don't want to field questions I can't answer. I want to look good in uh, answering questions. So uh, write them down, and then uh, we, obviously we can't spend long time dealing with Q&A. This is not a seminar, per se, but I'd be happy to try to respond to some of your questions. Or if you have great observations, write them down, and I can... Uh, Make you famous, too, by uh, reading your great observation uh, for the sake of the class. So claim God's promise. And then thirdly, delight in God's word. Delight in God's word. Uh, the Gospels are about Jesus. Uh, Jesus was a Jew. We'll come back to that again and again. Uh, I think in a number of the Gospels, it says something about Jesus along this line. Uh, on the Sabbath... He was in the synagogue, as was his custom. <laughs> you know, he was uh, a child of Judaism. He was circumcised on the eighth day. Uh, his family made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem every year. He knew what temple worship was about. He certainly knew what the Psalms were about. And when you study the life of Jesus, you see again and again how Jesus articulates his self-understanding in terms of the scriptures. Uh, whether you think about his temptation, and the devil keeps coming at him, and he quotes the Bible to the devil. You know, that was his first and really last line of defense, all three temptations. Uh, he replies with scripture. Or if you think about what Jesus says on the cross, a lot of what he says on the cross that's recorded for us He's quoting the scriptures. He was somebody, really, and it was Martin Luther, especially in the history of the church, that taught people to read the Psalms as an expression, not only of David, king of Israel, but in a lot of the Psalms, an expression of the son of David, Jesus Christ. So while this is David, this is also the sort of thing that you could easily imagine Jesus himself could have reflected on and internalized and practiced. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. But 
that person's delight, delight is in the law of the Lord. That's where I'm getting this on your handout. Delight in God's word. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, you know, we're Christians, so we're gospel people. We're not law people per se, but remember that word law there is Torah. And Torah doesn't, first of all, mean legislation. Torah, first of all, means guidance or instruction. Most people don't like being told what to do. But if you're right with God, you delight in knowing what pleases God. And so this person's delight is in the law of the Lord. And remember, Jesus said, I always do the things that are pleasing to my Father. That's Jesus. And who meditates on his instruction, his guidance, day and night. I don't know what you think about when you wake up at night, but when you read the Psalms, you realize the psalmist often will ponder God and think about God. And if you know God's word, that's one of the things probably you, you go back to. You know, when you can't sleep at night, counting sheep gets pretty boring, but you might say the Apostles' Creed, you might see the Lord's Prayer, you might go through some of the Psalms you know by heart, and the psalmist here gives us this idea, I'm meditating on the books of Moses. I'm meditating on things in Deuteronomy, or I'm going over the Ten Commandments or something. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, that is, whatever that person, those people do who meditate on God's word, prospers. Not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. Uh, literally, it says, the Lord knows. He knows, he understands the way of the righteous. He even works for them, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So that's a third sort of uh, beginning point in coming to understand the Gospels, is to delight in God's word. And it, it is hard to delight in something that you're frustrated in understanding. So there's kind of a mutual relationship between uh, understanding it and delighting in it. But hopefully as we uh, do our studies uh, hour by hour in this course, we'll get tools that will help us to delight in God's word more and more. So let's pause for prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for Holy Scripture. We're grateful for sending your Son into the world so that a way might be made for us to come into relationship with you, to have our sins forgiven, to have our eyes open to our need and uh, your sufficiency. Thank you for Jesus' example of being a person who looked to Holy Scripture for his own guidance and sustenance and growth and ministry. And we pray that we could walk in his steps as we also grow in wisdom and in uh, favor with people around us and with uh, you, God our Father in heaven. Uh, be with each person that's here. Be with their affairs um, at home or wherever it is that uh, they call their home, uh, unite us in a delight in what you have to say to us through the New Testament. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, on your handout, I mentioned ENT, and of course, that's uh, uh, encountering the New Testament. And there are two sort of sidebars, one on page 148 that I want to call your attention to. And uh, I think it might even, well, it doesn't say be a smart reader there, but I'm summarizing what we find on 148. Yeah, a little sidebar, it says, tips on meaningful Bible reading. Uh, over the years, you know, I've, I've seen people read the Bible a lot of different ways. And uh, I think I might even mention one if you read, if you read this book, uh, which I hope you will because the syllabus says you're supposed to, but I think I even tell the story uh, in this book, one of the chapter introductions, about a young man in a, in a uh, Bible study. And this was years ago when I was living in Scotland. And he was an artist. 
which is great. But uh, being an artist, you know, he really didn't like a lot of regulation. And so it was a young people's fellowship, and they asked me to talk about how to interpret the Bible. And he scowled the whole time I was talking. He was actually a young Welshman. And finally he said, well, I believe the way you should read the Bible is sit under a willow tree and let the wind blow the pages and then look down. And uh, uncharitably, of course, we call that the lucky dip method, right? Uh, just choose a verse and then try to make sense of it. That's not probably a, a, a way to get at the Bible's meaning that's going to uh, take you very far. We want to read it like we read other books. We don't just pick up a book and grab something out of it and try to go with it. Um, and I'll talk more about the Bible being uh, holy and, and distinct, but it is a book and we should read it in some ways the same way that we read any other book. We should read it with personal interest. Um, and by that, I especially mean uh, we come to God with grave needs. Uh, sometimes, and especially in my field, you know, I'm an academician, and a lot of academicians who are even great Bible scholars, they've got a social agenda. Uh, they want to maybe destroy the faith of people that come to university that they think is naive and unhelpful. They want to bring them into the scientific age, and they want to debunk their the belief of miracles of these college freshmen or the belief in moral absolutes or, or whatever. And so it's not uncommon to find scholars that don't read the Bible with personal interest. That is a word from God for them. They don't believe in God. But we need to read the Bible uh, in a way in which we place ourselves uh, at God's feet, so to speak, and uh, seek to have him talk to us through uh, what the Bible has to say. There are a lot of stories in the Bible. And uh, stories often don't carry their own interpretation in them. And so uh, while some stories um, do have a bit of a self-evident meaning, it's one reason why it's so important to read the Bible over and over again so we get everything that's in it, we want to interpret the narrative in close relationship to what the doctrinal passages have to say to us. And the more you read the Bible, the more you become conscious. There are different kinds of rhetoric in the Bible. And uh, it's not all the same, and we don't read it all the same way. Uh, there are some things, thou shalt not commit adultery. You know, that's one kind of a statement. Um, Raise up a child in the way he should go when he's old, he will not depart from it. That's another kind of a statement. These are different genres, and we'll talk about that. Um, in fact, that's number six. Give careful attention to genre. Be aware of what kind of a, of a text you have before you. Is it a historical text? Is it a doctrinal text? Is it a poetic text? Is it a hymnic text? Uh, is it a text talking about the end of the world? Destruction, smoke and fire and perdition. You know, we may call that apocalyptic. Uh, lots of passages in the New Testament, as well as the Old, are unclear. And we always want to interpret the unknown in the light of the known. And uh, if you have ever been in a discussion with someone that's antagonistic about Christianity, a lot of times they'd like to seize on things like, where did Cain's wife come from? You know, something that's obscure, and then try to so, say, well, if you can't answer that, I, you know, I, you can't answer anything. And uh, unfortunately... Nobody can answer all the questions that can be posed about what the Bible says. Where did evil come from? Or why did God allow evil? I mean, these are questions that uh, we can say, well, I think the Bible indicates this, but everybody doesn't agree on the meaning of some of these unclear passages. But there are lots of very clear passages, and that's what we want to focus on uh, rather than the unclear. It really helps if we have uh, a good Bible dictionary. And do you have a church library here? Uh, sometimes people make the mistake of trying to define biblical words with Webster's. Or now, since nobody knows you know, what a, a printed dictionary is, people Google something or Wikipedia something, and uh, they may or may not get a meaning that has anything to do with the biblical word. 
So Bible dictionaries are very important for understanding biblical terms. I already mentioned genre. And then finally, realities of prayer, Holy Spirit's guidance. And I'll just add in here other believers. Uh, the church, uh, pastoral leaders, the person who may be discipling you, uh, if you have a chaplain of some sort, a lot of times uh, will be stymied by something in the Bible. And especially when we're newer to the faith, uh, we really have no conception of how many millions of people over hundreds of years have wrestled with these same issues. And we're trying to reinvent the wheel. And it's good that we wrestle with things for ourselves, but a lot of times it's also good to kind of cut to the chase and talk to somebody that's maybe been down that road or can you know, give us information that will save us a lot of grief and possibly some error. So be a smart reader. And these tips on page 148, I think, at least in the third edition. Does somebody else have a different edition? Okay, and what, what page is that there? Okay, well, it's there somewhere in uh, the chapter on encountering Jesus in the Gospels, modern approaches to the New Testament. Um, then on page 17 in the third edition, there are 10 points. I won't go over them all. But, uh, and of course, you read chapter 1, or you are reading chapter 1. There's a lot of information in chapter 1, and... It has to do, really, first of all, with number one, how important the Bible is in especially the history of the West, but by extension, the history of the whole world. The Bible has shaped the world in which we live, and no one is free from its influence. And so uh, it's not only a, a religious uh, task to understand the Bible, it's uh, really a matter of seeing what's in the world at large. We learn a lot about ourselves. We learn a lot about cultures. We learn a lot about history. We learn a lot about humanity by uh, being an informed reader of the Bible. Then uh, I'll go to number 10. I mean, all these points are, are worthwhile. But uh, why should we study the New Testament? One is to avoid misinterpretation based on preconceived ideas. It's just human, and in fact, we can't do other. We see things in the light of what we think we know. That's just the way it is. And uh, the effect of that in the Bible is we tend to inflict our certainties on what we read. And if you've ever worked with folks and in inductive Bible studies, you know, you read the Bible and then you know, what do you think it says? You'll find the hardest thing in the world is to get people started. Once they start, it can go pretty fast. But to get them started actually articulating what they see there rather than cutting immediately to what I think based on something I see there. Because people will tend to interpret a verse based on what they already think they know. And, and they'll find something there that will help them say what they think. But we should study the New Testament. We study it, and hopefully it starts to get the upper hand. It starts to tell us what it's saying instead of us telling it what we think. And that's much harder than we think it is. Even for those of us who studied it for years, we still tend to inflict ourselves on the Word of God. Also, misplaced reliance on the Holy Spirit. This is more common in some circles than other. Sometimes people really seem not to believe in the Holy Spirit, but other times people seem like uh, they don't really need the Bible, they just need autopilot. <laughs> they just kind of open themselves up to some kind of religious intuition and uh, that's really, I think, what the art student Vivian was saying. Uh, I'll just let the wind blow and look down, and whatever impression I get from what I read, that's the Bible. And I, I would call that a misplaced reliance on the Holy Spirit. And I give a few other reasons here for interpreting the Bible uh, and ways to avoid uh, misunderstandings of it. 
But I think um, this is enough to say we've gotten started on this task of how to understand the Gospels. And uh, let's take a short break. Thank you.